Good evening. Good evening and welcome. I'm Esther Wolfson. I'm a writer. And here tonight with me in virtual space are the scholar, writer, and world-renowned commentator on religious affairs, Karen Armstrong. The distinguished writer and journalist, Amin Malouf, winner of the Prix Goncourt, whose new book is most presciently called Adrift, How Our World Lost Its Way. And Simon McBurney, founder of the wonderful theatre Complicité, who, while being described as auteur, actor, and anthropologist is much, much more than that. This evening's event is called Telling Stories, Truth, Lies, and the Death of Compassion. We're gathered in as much as we can be at this particular moment to talk about stories. Karen in London, Amin in Paris, Simon in Gloucestershire, and me in Aberdeen, together with everyone else whom we welcome most warmly. In the time we spend together, we want to place in some kind of context, how we got here, from this indisputably difficult moment to what we have to do to address the problem, which has brought about our present circumstance, and the role that telling stories of whatever kind, through theatre, writing, and the arts in general, has to play. Just before we begin, can I say that to see the captions, just click on the CC button. Questions can be written into the chat box on YouTube and we'll try and answer as many as we can after the talk. We all tell stories. They're one of the foundations upon which our lives and culture are based. The stories we tell are not just our own. There are others too. The results of dialogues and exchanges which we inherited and inherit and pass on from which we all learn. John Berger wrote of a lens through which the stories are both told and received in looking for the origins of the situation we find ourselves in. Which lens are we looking through? Which story are we telling? Because it's just one of the events which occurs from time to time over history. Or do we, believe, do we believe that this time it's different? What can we learn from our own and each other's stories? Perhaps it's worth beginning with our, the origins of our predicament. Simon, you've written Theatres are empty, concert halls are silent, and there seems to be in this a chilly reminder of a very well-known book, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which was published in uh, 1964, which was an early warning of the death of the natural world. You write too of global warming, species decline, our destruction of the earth, and how we still feel separate from nature. And I wondered, what role has our separation from nature played in our present situation? Do you see a relationship between how we view ourselves as humans and how we see other species? Oh, goodness. Um, well, that's a question which uh, you talk about wonderfully uh, in your book. Um, first of all, yes, as a, an actor, performer, theatre director, um, we have been unable to go into theatres. Uh, my wife is a concert pianist. Uh, we have been able, musicians have been unable to play live. There have been many wonderful incidences of, of orchestras coming together online, but the live experience, the gathering together in a room has not been possible. And so, of course, one of the questions that keeps on coming up is, uh, well, does this matter? Does it matter that we can't gather together at all? Does it, you know, uh, 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 in fact, um, uh, some people have suggested it'll uh, provide a kind of welcome uh, a sloughing off of or sloughing off of uh, unnecessary and uh, uh, extra bits of sort of not terribly good aspects of our artistic culture. And I, uh, of course, I would take issue with that. 
And I would also take issue with the idea that um, the arts are only important because of the kind of, uh, of of the economic value of what it adds to the uh, 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 the nation's uh, uh, coffers. I mean, we do have to remember that more people, when uh, theatre was on last year, more people went to see theatre than went to see football. So it does uh, a huge does. It's, it's an enormously powerful aspect of our culture. But I would also argue that theatre is not just something that occurs in theatres, but it's part of uh, all aspects of our life. A funeral is also a uh, is a piece of theatre, as is a wedding, as are celebrations. They all have stories at their centre, whether it's a story of the family or it's a story that you're actually telling. Um, and so this being cut off from theatre uh, or the theatres being closed, that you come to meditate on the fact that theatre is probably a sign of a healthy society in whatever that means. That's to say the, the health of society means that there is a forum in which you can share these stories. And when you share these stories, a particular thing happens when you gather together, as was shown in research by the University of Chicago not so very long ago, when a group, large audience gather together quite quickly after they begin to watch a play, their hearts begin to beat in unison. So something happens in this conjunction, in this coming together, just as something happens when uh, we are uh, feel intimately connected uh, with the outside world. And remember that early theatres connected both inner and outer worlds. So if you went to Epidavros, for example, which was made for 14,000 people, they would have seen the stage, but they would have seen beyond the stage into nature. And so uh, immediately the act of performing and the presence of nature were uh, um, uh, um, uh, together. And of course, uh, my father was prehistorian, so I always imagine that the origins of theatre were around a fire. So darkness has always been part of theatre. The telling of stories has always been uh, uh, um, uh, in, in darkness, if you like. And you can imagine people gathered around a fire, telling a story, performing, perhaps performing animals, perhaps performing stories about uh, uh, the people themselves, perhaps performing their origin myths. And against the walls behind them, the trees or the walls of a cave or wherever they were situated would be shadows. And a secondary world would be uh, evoked. So um, what have we lost with these things being closed? Well, the first thing I would suggest is this question, is the question of what, what happens when a group of people come together. And perhaps we can talk more of that as we go on. Um, something uh, also that John Berger said was, there's something about an empty theatre. Yes, they are full, which I found rather a, rather a sort of hopeful thing that, that the theatre is there, whatever. I, I, I thought that was extremely nice. Yeah, um, when, when I was um, talking about the idea of, of um, how our situations come about, the question or something I wanted to ask Karen was about ideas of human exceptionalism in our relationship with other species. It's an idea which has persisted throughout history as a religious idea, has our fixation with our own exceptionalism contributed to what we've done to the earth and other species? I think I take issue with the idea that it's, that's always been in religion. Um, I think it's been very much part of modern religion. and by Modern, modern religion, yes, quite. Religion here in the West, uh, yeah. with, the, with the beginnings of modernity. And modernity has pro progressed by separations of all kinds uh, because it was creating something new. So it was breaking away from the past. Um, and uh, one of the, and certainly religion became a kind of private quest in the head. Uh, whereas before, and I was just tuning into what Simon was saying just now about the whole business of ritual. Uh, ritual was essential to religion because it was communal, it was dramatic, 
Uh, it was performed outside and it was always about nature. Uh, the divine was not some reality stuck in a heaven, distant from us in distant deeps and skies, as Blake put it. Uh, it was within every uh, blade of grass, every wind, every, it was absolutely omnipresent. And the rituals uh, the, of the, the, it, that uh, are, involved the body as well as just the mind were essential because we learn a great, great deal from our bodies. And that's sort of rather being cut out of a lot, a lot of modern thought. Um, so I think uh, religion is it has has founded because it's it's lost it's lost its roots here in the West, and certainly uh, we've lost that sense of complete community with with the natural world, which is it's essential. Somehow we should try and re restore. Well, that's right. I mean, this is what I'm saying. The the roots of our problem it really lie in the separation. And it's, it's it is just one of the separations between between humans and other species and humans of all sorts from each other. Um, utterly bound up with our telling of, um, of stories are the words which we use to do so. And something that's become clear is that in this incredibly challenging time, it's been made even more terrifying by the distortions and and lies and untruths. And I mean, you, you called your, one of your books adrift, and that seems particularly opposite because so many of us do feel adrift at the moment. Perhaps the essential belief in our own stories has been shaken by current events. What happens to a society when its stories are hijacked and transformed into narratives of lies? I, I think... Uh, 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 Nation needs to have its story as a nation. Uh, humankind need to have their story as humankind. And I think uh, the idea of building the world needs a story. Uh, we have uh, shatters stories uh, uh, and w we are uh, in a world which is coming uh, towards a kind of objective unity. At the same time, in our minds, we are uh, more and more separated from each other. Uh, a French historian Marc Bloch used to say, we are children of our times, more than the children of our parents. And I think it's very true. This is the reality of our life stories. This is the reality of what we have become, but it is not the reality of how we perceive ourselves. We are closer to any person, any contemporary, anywhere in the world. We have the same the same references, the same uh, values, uh, mainly. Uh, at the same time, we don't feel so close to our contemporaries. We insist that our profound relationship is with, with our ancestors, with our tribe, with our own tribe. And uh, I think one of the main uh, uh, issues in today's world is how to go from a divided story to a united or at least to a converging and harmonized human story. Yeah. Yes, I'm what, what's... I, I, I mean, that's uh, uh, the... Um, and one of the questions of separation 
uh, when we're here and we're all in these little boxes, it seems to emphasize the fact that, <laughs> yeah. that we are, um, uh, you know, I kind of keep on wanting to kind of reach across into other boxes, <laughs> imagining that a hand can kind of come out of them. But I mean, I, one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, there's been some beautiful things, of course, as everyone has said over and over again in lockdown, extraordinary things have been sort of the appearance of wild animals in cities. There's been the sort of sudden burst of little communities and so on uh, that people haven't seen before but uh, uh, there has also been profound uh, sense of loneliness and in fact talking to Karen and maybe she'll talk about it later she it, it was fascinating yesterday with Karen when you were when we were chatting and you were talking about your experience being a nun when you were in a community and yet you felt utterly you never felt more alone in your life that was extraordinary but I suppose in answer to thinking about what Armin has said and talking thinking about stories is that um, we live, it seems to me, what, one of the effects, I mean, you know, I don't know, I, I can only speak from the experience of, of a theatre performer, what it feels like to that. What you know as a theatre performer, you get out on stage and you make somebody laugh, uh, 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 and it's not one person, it is a whole laughter. Or if there is people who are weeping, it is the whole uh, of the audience. And of course, Aristotle understood this in understanding that the nature of tragedy was to get at least a third of Athens out in Epidavros, 14,000 people, uh, to feel pity for a circumstance which was a political, a real political circumstance in the plays that uh, 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 they were writing at the time. And I suppose one of the things that I feel the, the principal separation is this idea that I uh, uh, really live here, that I'm living here inside my head. And, and I'm, I'm very much part of that experience. I mean, that is my real experience. You know, I, 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 I find it very difficult to, uh, you know, I very find it very difficult to persuade myself that my name is not Simon McBurney and that I am not Karen Armstrong and I'm not Armin Malouf. Uh, I'm not Esther. And uh, uh, um, I, I really am only me. And this is only my experience. But one of the curious things in the theatre is that this uh, uh, your 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 consciousness what, what what you experience as an actor when the audience is there is that um suddenly their sense of consciousness seems to uh, uh align their imagination uh, seeps into the imagination of other people. They are all imagining the same thing at the same time, and you get an extraordinary sense of collective. Uh, consciousness, and it alerts us to this idea that perhaps, uh, you know, this is this is one of the lies that we have perpetuated: is the idea that we live inside here. Now, one of the first talks we had was um, as a result of doing the encounter, which was about this experience in the Amazon. Uh, we talked to a wonderful friend of mine called Takuma Kuikuru, who lives in the Jingu, in uh, his indigenous community. He's a filmmaker. He's a, a, a uh, 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 and he he brilliantly talked about their in their village their experience of storytelling, in which he said all our stories begin and end in nature, uh, and that we living as we do both in the modern world and in our world, which hasn't changed really since prehistory, um, uh, we, we feel we have a double consciousness. One is what he calls the white consciousness and the other is their consciousness. But in their consciousness, uh, it, it is impossible for a story to begin in the individual and go out and end in the individual. It always begins in nature and it passes through us and it comes back out into nature and i think this is for me the thing that i feel that where theater really does have a place is this sense it is to try and touch on the lie that we are simply individual consciousnesses which end you know i don't know at the end of our nose or you know wherever it is somewhere just behind our eyes uh because it, it, it it's it's um uh 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 it means that we see ourselves really as separate from everything. Yes, yeah, something that was very interesting, I, I was reading about um, your time in Jingu and um, the meeting is on, upon which the encounter is based. The talk, the talk of, of two consciousnesses and how the consciousness, how consciousness began in the, the forest and how people looked outward to the forest for 
their own consciousness. I found that very fascinating. Yeah, that was an interesting, that was another, in fact, another community even deeper uh, ah. in the forest who, who when, when I asked them where was their consciousness, and I'd ask this of actors, and some people say behind my eyes, some people pr pr talk about their heart, some people talk about the end of their hands, uh, some people talk the space of the room. But when I asked them where did they feel that their, their consciousness lay, they indicated the forest and i thought that they hadn't understood the question stupid me but i, I got it retranslated in various different ways and eventually i of course i understood it was me who didn't understand because they didn't see as far as they were concerned the community that i was in there was no separation between their inner life and the life they saw outside which was as complex as incomprehensible as infinite as everything that we experience inside. And if something, as far as they could tell, if something uh, uh, was disastrous as happening outside in the forest, it reflected something within them. And to a certain extent, I now, of course, it's now easy to understand. If you look at the destruction of the Amazon, you see, of course, we are also suffering from some terrible uh, 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 inner sickness, if you like. So the, you know, in that sense, they are absolutely right. The outer world is reflecting something which is happening within us. And that's my feeling. That, I, that, that's a peculiarly interesting because the idea of consciousness that only we have it, uh, because the moment you extend the idea of consciousness to other creatures, which has really only become a, a possibility with the advances in, in um, neuroanatomy and neuroscience, the idea that other species have the neurological substrates to produce consciousness. The minute, you, the minute you begin to think that that other creatures have consciousness, it alters the world. And, and that's a very good example, the, idea, the, the suggestion that it is something wider than just an individual thing. Karen, did you come across this? I know that you've been writing a, a book about, about nature. I just wondered if... Absolutely. Listening to you, Simon, I, I, I just completed my studies. Of, of, of I, I've only done this from books from, from the indigenous people, that there is absolutely no separation between uh, the, the, the forest or the, or the stream or the hill uh, that, and themselves. It's, it's, it's called participation by the scholars, that uh, we participate in everything. Now, we've blocked off that as, as we've gone further in, into civilization. Um, and um, I, I think uh, that you would, I was, I think this began, especially in the modern period uh, with Descartes, who uh, creates modern thought uh, during the, th one night during the uh, Thirty Years' War when he's a gentleman soldier and he's held up and he has to take refuge in a little, uh, little room with a stove in it. And stuck in this little room, um, he creates uh, this immense mind-breaking uh, breakthrough into modern thought, uh, where he says, I think, therefore I am. And it is the assertion of the individuality the, the insertion, a lonely assertion of the human. Uh, and, uh, but he was a break and, and uh, neurologists who, who read his meditations say, you know, it, it almost broke, it was almost this kind of schizophrenia, this, this breakthrough into an entirely different mode of consciousness uh, because um, he, uh, would he, he, he would look outside, he said in his meditations, I look outside at the people walking in the street and I have to ask myself sincerely, what, are they really humans or are they machines? Um, and, and then he has a huge difficulty feeling that he has a body. He's become such in, separated, incarnated, discarnated mind that he's lost his sense of the physical and of the external world. Now, none of us are quite as uh, acutely uh, schizophrenic as this, 
But in the sense, we've completely lost that. And listening to you too, Simon, uh, the certainly, um, you know, most of the, what we call the world religions, which is what I study, uh, are not as, as attuned with nature as, as, as the tribal peoples. But certainly they have this sense of oneness with it that you, and the Chinese, for example, uh, developed a system of thought and meditation whereby you begin with what they call gewu, the investigation of things. And then you move to uh, the, the human person and, and gradually work your way out from the individual, then to your tribe, uh, then to your local city, then again, reaching out again to uh, the, the whole country, then out to the whole world and finally reass reasserting yourself with, with nature, putting yourself back in contest. It's a sort of meditative exercise to place yourself in the, in the world. And that is something that I think we've completely lost. Uh, and it, it's, it's coming out in all kinds of ways, not just our uh, appalling uh, treatment of the environment, but the way we treat other people too. Um, in, 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 in our world, uh, that we, there is that Cartesian, uh, I think, therefore I am, the whole thing somehow based on the human thinking, uh, creating the world and losing that sense of, and it, of, of organic separateness with other peoples far away or even near to, as well as nature. That, that, that's something, the questions of identity and the individual. In, uh, on identity, um, I mean, you uh, were, uh, wrote, many have left their native land and many, though they haven't left it, can no longer recognize it. Do you think even without the pandemic, this has become a universal sense um, and one that increasing numbers of us feel this disassociation from our own place? Yes, it's certainly true of countries that uh, have gone through wars and destruction. But I think it's true of uh, the whole world because uh, things have moved so, so rapidly that even if we haven't left the place we, are, we were born, uh, we feel we are in a, in a different country. So the, the, the whole world has uh, changed and we, we cannot really follow uh, mentally all the changes. And I think uh, if we sum up the, the problems of the world in one sentence, I think it's the gap between the speed of evolution, the technical, scientific, and our capacity to, uh, to, to cope with the with evolution, and I think we we, we are lagging lagging behind, and uh, uh, I th I think uh, this is this is true today, and uh, it 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 is also uh, a, a a problem that we will going to we are going to to ex uh, experience much more in the future because I think we, we are at the beginning of an era. We don't know exactly what it will be, but it is a, a, a new era in which we need new, uh, new references, new, new uh, uh, ways of thinking, new, new elements of, of evaluation. And, and people talk about, I mean, this is the year that I can completely uh, um, concur with you, Amin, and, and this is the extraordinary sort of <laughs> uh, uh, idea uh, of, of uh, or, or the, 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 there are two things. One is the fact that the, it seems here in, in this country, in many countries, there's a sort of um, an extraordinary sense of not being quite sure of, of, of homelessness, perhaps. The sense that uh, um, wanting to define your home and part of the definition of being, defining your home is not letting anybody else uh, uh, near where you are. 
And of course, we live in an era of uh, where, uh, but the extraordinary thing about that is, is, the, is the idea that somehow we're going to stop people moving about because it seems to me that we are just on, we're just on the little, we're just at the point with the little waves before the great waves of migration are about to start. I, I, There's going to be waves of migration that nobody can even conceive of now. And in fact, of course, as we know, the you know uh, uh, this is this is also intimately connected with nature, uh, as parts of the world become uninhabitable for a lot of uh, uh, very understandable reasons. And in fact, that was so extraordinary. And you probably well, you know a great deal more about this than I do. But the the fact that water dried up in southern Syria was incredibly important. The migration of the southern Syrians north to create the conflict that uh, uh, began to happen. Uh, there, that certainly seems to be part of it. But I mean, here in Europe, it's absurd the idea that we're going to <laughs> somehow we're going to create walls uh, for uh, uh, the, which means that people uh, 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 can't travel. I mean, we. Uh, it is so interesting. I, I think I, I absolutely feel what you feel that we are on the verge of a, something completely new, and that people have really no idea the scale of the change that is going to happen. And I think that there are some modern delusions. Yeah. One of them is that uh, uh, we are in an open world and the travel is easier than, than in the past. And it's absolutely uh, false because people 100 years ago, uh, they were able to travel much more easily. Stefan Zweig used to say that he could go to India without having a passport. He was, <laughs> and and today, today, the, the 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 thickness of the borders is without precedent in history. This yeah. is one delusion. Another delusion is a, a, a different matter, but I I'm always fascinated by it. We are supposed to be in the age of speed, yet we are, we are, uh, when we look at the the uh, writers, the 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 composers of the past. They could work much more than uh, we do. Look at Verdi, who could produce three operas in a year, while today it's impossible to produce an opera in less, in less than three or four years. We are heavier. <laughs> we are much heavier. We're not. We're not quicker. They. They. The, the speed has has not given us any edge. We are just more bureaucratic, more uh, uh, more difficult to move. Everything is complicated. Everything is, and at the end, we, we, we produce much less. Uh, imagine somebody like Mozart who died at 35 ha after having written so, so many things. And there are writers and composers and others. And today we, we are, we are a bit arrogant. We think that we are privileged of the age of speed and we can travel everywhere. In fact, we, we, it's much more difficult to travel. It's much more difficult to work. <laughs> so yeah. we need to be more, more humble, more modest. I mean, in the, the just, it's just uh, quickly, just I won't take long, but this is an anecdote I'm thinking about. The friend, there's a, a friend of mine who lives in Paris, or it's a friend of mine, a, 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 an acquaintance, somebody who was very kind to me, a man called Jim Haynes, who was a, 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 a kind of extraordinary hippie. He founded the first. Uh, paperback bookshop in Britain. He founded the Travers Theatre and was one of the instigators of the people in the late, late 1950s who began the Edinburgh Fringe. So they, there's a kind of theatrical connection there and that's how I know him. But I know in his most anarchic days after he founded the Arts Lab in London in the late 1960s, in the early 70s, he went to Amsterdam and founded a magazine with Germain Greer called Suck. Um, about <laughs> less said the better. But after that, he had a wonderful idea where he, in the mid-90s, this is the mid 1970s after all he created something called the international passport which i thought was absolutely wonderful and then distributed it to all sorts of people and people were still traveling on an international passport way into the mid 1980s in southeast asia which i thought was an absolutely wonderful idea but you're quite right that would be absolutely impossible today it simply wouldn't be possible and this um I find that very interesting, this idea of, 
of 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 heaviness um yeah that you speak of something very interesting that you were that you wrote about in um, adrift i mean are the two dates that you you pinpoint as being you know hugely significant um well 191979 is one of them i just wondered if you could kind of talk a bit about yeah. About why? I mean, I would agree completely, but then it <laughs> tends to be a a memory thing, you know. What you know, what you, you know, from your own experiences. 1979 is the year when the conservatives in the world proclaimed themselves revolutionaries. <laughs> of yeah. course, the, uh, there is not much in common between the conservative revolution of Mrs. Satcher and the Islamic revolution of Ayatollah Khomeini. But there was a trend that uh, uh, was uh, uh, spread worldwide of conservative ideas, conservative social forces taking over their revolution and all the former progressives becoming conservative, trying to, to maintain what had been achieved before and drifting quietly toward a kind of conservatism. And this happened in, in a matter of months. You know. And uh, uh, with, uh, uh, in China, uh, uh, December 78, uh, Deng Xiaoping took over and he, uh, get got rid of the Maoist revolution. Uh, Pope uh, John Paul II was elected in October 78, and he was in his own way a conservative revolutionary. And in, in 79 in uh, Iran and Britain and the, the following year, uh, Ronald Reagan was elected. And the events of that year shaped the world for the last 40 years. Yeah, very, very much so. For, is it something that that be, that happens all over the place for a reason, or is you know is it just the, the, the confluence of circumstance? Do you think? I think it was. There were many elements. It uh, there are of course many reasons, but one of the elements was the beginning of the collapse of communism, of the Soviet Union, which obviously was not able to fulfill its promises, and the rise of, of opposing forces, uh, op forces that were uh, more, uh, more in uh, the affirmation of identity in some part of the world, and of the affirmation of the new, uh, a, a, a different way of, of uh, making politics and a different way of making a, uh, the economic decisions. Uh, Adam Smith became, became again the main reference for economics and, and it, it became the new norm for the whole world, in fact. I, I think Karen was. Yes. Um, I, I, I was thinking, too, of the rise at this time of what we uh, often call fundamentalism in, in, in religion uh, that happened about this time. And I found in my studies that a lot of this was rooted in a profound fear, uh, that a feeling um, that, uh, that, they were, that in nearly every one of these movements began with what was perceived to be an assault by the liberal and secular uh, society. Uh, started in the United States uh, and, uh, and, then, and then progressed out. So this sense of, of uh, because of fear, because of lo a profound loss of, of identity, a sort of something that, uh, that uh, kicks, kicks you in, in, in the absolute depth of your being, that what makes you what you are. And not always was, was the response creative or because it, 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 with fear, people tend to get, get aggressive back. 
uh, but but it it and all these movements I wouldn't uh, the religious movements I wouldn't say actually were conservative. Uh, they were all modern. They were all new and innovative. They seem to be saying conservative things like, you know, we, scripture is right and uh, every word of it is right. But uh, that, that itself was an absolute new development in the history of religion. So in a sense, these people were moving forward, uh, trying to move forward uh, it, in a way that we considered, because it was against our liberal principles, was moving backward. Um, and uh, but that that sense of fear, I think, is something that we have to take very seriously into into account right at the moment, because fear can provide uh, nihilistic horror, can provide violence, terror. Um, and why have we made people feel terrified? Why have we? Because very often uh, in these. Uh, these uh, religious uh, issues, which happened in every single religion, religious tradition at about the same time, there was disdain from the liberals, a sense of, of uh, which, uh, which again is not worthy, uh, a worthy way of, of living with people. But that sense of disdain was what produced a lot of this fanaticism. And of course that has continued. The other date that, that is significant, and you write a great deal fascinatingly about it, I mean, is 1967. And of course that ties into what you're talking about as well, Karen. Um, uh, 1967 is uh, the war, uh, what is called in, in the West, the Six Days War. Uh, in the Arab world, uh, they feel this, uh, this name is a, uh, uh, slightly humiliating because <laughs> uh, so the, the name in the Arab world is the 67 war or the June war or uh, in any case it was uh, uh, what, what was very important at that time was the defeat of the main figure of Arab nationalism who was President Nasser of Egypt and those who can remember what was Nasser at that time? He was a huge, huge figure on the world stage, and in the Arab world, he was uh, mm -hmm. his his uh, uh, photos were everywhere, from uh, from Mauritania to to uh, to Iraq. He he was loved by uh, the the Arab uh, masses, and nobody expected that he would be crushed. So swiftly and so totally. And uh, if you allow me to, to, to uh, tell a, an anecdote, a personal anecdote, I was at that time, I was 18 years old. I was a student in Beirut. And on uh, uh, the 9th, I think it was Friday 9th of June 67, I had uh, uh, to, to receive the, the results of my first uh, uh, university exams. And I had forgotten the exam because Nasser had resigned that day. And my mother asked me, did, did you get your result? I said, no, I forgot to, to go. So I went to the university. I looked on the wall and there were the results. I looked, I saw my name. I got out from college and I had forgotten if I had uh, failed or <laughs> if I was received. The, the 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 mental confusion was such, and I, I think I was not only one in that situation. It uh, the, the whole Arab world was completely struck on the head by something, and Arab nationalists never recovered, never recovered, and in uh, uh, there was a new kind of nationalism, which was based on religion, but no, at, at no point it, it, it had the same aura, the, the same uh, influence that Nasser had. So in the Arab world, uh, something was lost completely at that time. And it produced a, 
a sense of despair that has continued until now. And at one point, it was, it became uh, violence, it became terror, and it spread throughout the world uh, with the same despair and without any perspective of, of any solution, of any redemption. Yeah. So that yeah. 67 was important for that. Yeah, yeah. And Karen, you've written a lot about, about this in about conflict and its effects in fields of blood and, and so on. I just wondered if you had... Oh, I see, I thought you were going just oh. about... Oh, no, 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 no. Yes, I think this is absolutely right. I think despair and fear have 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 been at the root of a lot of the of a lot of these uh, these movements, um, and uh, that so the and, and but it's looked upon with from the liberal or secular perspective with disdain. And that simply exacerbates the, the entire matter. And I, I was thinking in 1967, um, I was still a nun and just about to break out of that. And you see, I'd been so incarcerated and kept from anything. I had never heard, I never heard, we never heard of any of this. And we were told about one thing, and that was the Cuban Missile Crisis. You had no access to? Newspapers or anything. Because uh, I, I, I was a trainee, you see, so we were kept in special isolation. They did tell us about the, uh, as I said, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1963, um, and told us that the world was in danger. But then they forgot to tell us that the crisis was over. So you lived it with, <laughs> no, well, with a thought of it. <laughs> uh, uh, three whole weeks, we went, you were never allowed to ask what was happening in, in the world. We went and, for, you know, I was scat, you used to take my mop down to shake it at the dust, he was looking for mushroom clouds. And all <laughs> uh, until finally we were, told, so we did ask. Mm -hmm. Some one brave person asked at recreation, uh, you know, "What is there in the use of Cuba?" So, oh, oh, half terribly funny, didn't we tell you? That was <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, terrible. I would love to. I would love to pick up on your word uh, 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 disdain. Um, I think this is uh, um, there's something very interesting um, about what you say, which perhaps has its origins in something much uh, uh, um, older, which you mention in your book on myth, which is really the question of how, uh, uh, at what point does uh, the idea of, you know, our, um, uh, at what point do we get separated from our myths? At what point does our, our brain, our mind, what you make the distinction between mythos and logos, at what point does our intellectual mind begin to become separate from our, uh, um, uh, uh, our mythic understanding of the world? And you make this beautiful point in the book about how, um, uh, and I've, I feel this is fundamentally true, particularly when you look at the kind of uh, the amazing cave art of somewhere like the Chauvet Cave in France, which dates to 35,000 years old. But you make this point about how a prehistoric uh, man or woman seeing a stone doesn't only see it as it's sort of a, a, a pebble will not only see uh, its physical object but will see its place in mythic terms of course simultaneously so the the the, the spiritual and the mundane the the mythic and the everyday exists absolutely inseparably uh, uh, together uh, and um uh, so I was interested in this this question of 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 disdain, the idea, of course, which uh, comes about that for uh, anything uh, which talks of the numinous or the spiritual or the mythic being seen as something outside of the consciousness of sort of modern um, empirical, scientific Western uh, thought. 
um, which of course has led us to the point where we are. And in the book on myth, I feel, I feel it, to a certain extent, the same thing is true of, of dare I say it, of, of, of the way that people regard art. And one of the problems, of course, with it is that it's become embroiled. And one of the problems to do with 67 and 79, and having lived through 79, is, is the whole change in the way that uh, uh, everything suddenly turns into uh, um, the, the whole world simply sees everything in terms of ever increasing profit. And so everything is to do with product, to do with um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, objectifying to do with the value of things. Um, and to a certain extent, the, the disdain for art is exemplified by its sort of increasing value, if you like. And John Burge, of course, talks about this marvellously in uh, uh, The Success and Failure of Picasso, where he opened it enormously controversially. He wrote in this book in the early 1960s saying, uh, uh, Picasso is now the most famous artist in the world. He is also the richest. Uh, and then goes to, he says, whatever, uh, um, uh, 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 he's a little bit like the myth of Midas, uh, whatever Midas touched, touched to gold, whatever Picasso draws a line around, he can have. Uh, and of, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, uh, but this disdain that I'm talking about perhaps has its origin in some of these uh, uh, areas in the sense that art too has become certainly, you know, uh, 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 b has become almost like something which is an add on that, that, that I can't remember which famous American critic uh, talked about it as mental cheesecake. Um, uh, uh, whereas, of course, uh, uh, it is at the heart because of the sort of the necessity of its, 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 if you like, its mythical connection or the way that it connects human beings with the, 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 uh, the, the, the mythical world, um, uh, uh, it, 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 um, uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's, its function is, 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 it is in fact the main course. Uh, rather than the dessert, it is the thing that sustains you because of course we couldn't speak without the use of words. Uh, everybody, you know, we are human beings as we started off, are uh, storytellers. We are artists. We, are, we, we, we follow our own stories. We tell our own stories. Yes, we take stories from elsewhere, um, uh, but in the sense that we are all um, uh, 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 authors. I mean, John Berger, as, just to go back to John Berger and to quote him, he says, I think in the same book that you were talking about is um, uh, uh, we are, we, we are, he talks about a friend. We are both storytellers lying on our backs. We look up at the night sky. This is where stories began under the aegis of that multitude of stars, which at night filch certitudes and sometimes return them as faith. Those who first invented and then named the constellations were storytellers tracing an imaginary line between a cluster of stars gave them an image, an identity. The stars threaded on that line were like events threaded on a narrative. Imagining the constellations did not, of course, change the stars, nor did it change the black emptiness that surrounds them. What it changed was the way that people read the night sky. And so the, I, I, I think that's a very, uh, um, so I, I was just thinking about the, the nature of uh, uh, disdain and the, and, uh, uh, and the, the um, expendability, if you like, of this question of, of uh, our artistic life. I would Sorry, like to add one word about disdain. I think disdain is also the way uh, the, an ideology that prevails looks at other ideas. And I think uh, uh, what is disdained becomes the, the basis of what will be built uh, in the next phase. Because uh, uh, we have seen so many disdained ideas because nobody was noticing them, nobody was, was uh, uh, giving them their place, uh, developing separately and becoming the basis of something different. And uh, yep, I mean the other side of that, and, and one of the other topics of the evening is the death of compassion. 
And I wanted to bring you in here, Karen, because you are known for your Charter for Compassion, which is, of course, such a, a, a huge idea. I just wondered if you could tell us a bit about it. Yes, and, and it, it comes very clearly off this business about disdain, uh, which is all about ego. Uh, it, it's about my uh, ideas, uh, 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 and it builds up one's own self, sense of self. And a great deal of our troubles today are based on this sort of desperate concern, starting with Descartes, ergo sum, I, I, I think, therefore, I am, yet again, uh, that this that the ego, the survival of the ego is, 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 is key. Whereas basically liberation lies in the loss of ego. That's, that's the source. That's what yoga is all about. It's not about, uh, as it's practiced today, about feeling wonderfully warm and comfortable and happy and serene about yourself. It was started as a, dis, as a, as a, dis, as a, a very disciplined loss of that ego, which leads to a sense of liberation. And, 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 and here we come uh, to compassion because the major world religions all found that the safest way of, in, of, of numbing this ego, this, this greedy urge, like a, like a baby that is, we cry out for more and more attention and more and more uh, valuation, et cetera. Uh, the, the, the best is, is to put your, is to the practice of the golden rule. Uh, as Confucius said, do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. Um, and it means that you look into your own heart, discover what gives you pain, and then refuse under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. And that means you have to go beyond that ego. And with it comes liberation. Um, because, but... Uh, whereas the more we try and prop up this ego with uh, disdain, with a sense of superiority, uh, with a sense of our, um, our it's a, a profound instability, uh, the, 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 the worse we get, we get lost in, in, in this toil of ego, which imprisons us within ourselves. And I got sick and tired of hearing about religious leaders coming on and talking about doctrines or uh, contraception or abortion or all these matters, when if we look at the world and what it needs now is to put that golden rule into practice. It was the basis of the religions and you, yet you never heard about it. So I got, won the TED Prize uh, some years back and they, in those days they gave you a um, some money, but the main thing was they gave you a wish for a better world, which they would try to make happen. So I said, I, I'd like to create a charter for compassion, created by major uh, th thinkers, not, not archbishops and people, though we did have one bishop, uh, uh, but, but thinkers and activists re representing all the major world faiths that we come together and say that this was what mattered in religion. It's what our world needs. Because unless now we learn to treat all peoples, whether we like them or not, as we would wish to be treated ourselves, the world is not going to be a viable place. Um, so we did this, we did this charter. It's been a bit of an up and down journey because the trouble with compassion is it brings a lot of softies out of the woodwork, as it were who are all very keen to sort of feel nice and warm and happy about compassion, but that it's hard. It needs a, a continual uh, going away from the self. Uh, and I mentioned the, the Chinese concentric circles. You go from uh, yourself, then to your family, then to your city, then to your country and finally the whole world. And now that, that whole world has got to be in our global uh, compass. Uh, otherwise the world, it's simply not going to be viable. And it, it requires a constant, uh, uh, but people were just, uh, Ted had the idea that all you, if, if you just helped an old lady across the road, you should 
uh, post it up and you get a million acts of compassion. I said, this is, this is not the point. We need to go deeply. The most successful of the, of the charter is interestingly in Pakistan. Uh, there, uh, where uh, a, a friend of mine, a businessman, who is also a leading social activist, has uh, created, he, 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 he said to the Karachi, we're going to make a compassionate city out of Karachi. What would you like to see? And they all, they did a, a survey. They said, want education. So he got together a whole uh, team of leading educationalists in the country. And together they crafted a syllabus that inserted compassion into core subjects of the curriculum, like history, literature, languages, et cetera, science, etc. cetera. And uh, they, so, and now, and various schools took it on. Now the whole of the, uh, all the government schools in Sindh are schools of compassion and they, ha they have to achieve that. But they also make friends because these are mostly schools in, uh, among the more privileged and they have to, each school has to adopt a school in the poverty areas where they get to see the problems uh, and don't just live in a, in a rich bubble. Um, and um, so that they, uh, they, they, they get a sort of wider, they're now moving into the next province. And this in a country like Pakistan, which probably should never have come into being, uh, has immense problems. Uh, the, 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 the generosity and eagerness of this. Now in America, People are just more keener on being, uh, having a good feeling. And, you know, yes, our city is compassionate. And my plan, I still, I still try and work on this, that with all our problems, we need to link cities, to get compassionate cities together, so that Karachi can link with Boston, for example. And the children can, and the, and the schools can uh, have uh, email co correspondence and gradually some of the misapprehensions we have about one another can be, can be broken down. But it's, 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 it's a sort of work in progress. It's, uh, a, it's a, a superb idea, Karen. Well, I think that there are, our time has run out. Um, it seems to have gone terribly quickly. And I want to thank you very much indeed, Ka Karen. Think, are, are there some questions that have come yes, in? Yes, yes, there are. Um, First of all, before we end, can I say that, that um, Complicity is running a Christmas fundraising appeal for Crossroads Women, a charity for destitute women and children, asylum seekers, based in North London, just around the corner from the Complicity offices. If you enjoy the talk and can do so, your donations would be most welcome. The appeal link can be found in the, the um, description below on the Complicity website. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, now, for questions. We will start looking at them now. Yes, a question from Cohen Ambrose. Whose stories are the most important to tell right now? Any, any? All of them, all of them. I think uh, 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 every every person has a duty towards uh, uh, one's own s uh, story, the story uh, to, to which uh, they relate. And I think if we have all the stories, we have the 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 true picture of the world as it is. So. Every every story is is important. I think. I, was, I think I think that there's a. Oh, sorry, I was interrupting you, Karen. Go. I, I was just saying I'd like to hear uh, from uh, people who don't have a voice. Yes. Uh, that you know, I mean, it's all right for somebody uh, like me who gets into the media and can write books and get. But there are so many people 
uh, in so many parts of the world that just don't have a voice, who are totally ignored. And I, I, I'd like to hear, find some ways of getting these voices her, their st these stories told, brought out into the open so that we can begin to see uh, the, 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 the problems that people are having throughout the world and the immense work that's got to be done to try and rectify some of the issues. I would, and I would, I would second that and say that actually there is enormous amount for us uh, here, uh, you know, in, in, in the white Western world to uh, listen to uh, voices right on the edges of our of our world and my experience with, um, for example, my friend Takuma Kuikuru in the in in the Amazon, is that they have uh, he has something they have his whole village have something so incredibly uh, key to tell us right now about what is happening about our relationship with nature mm -hmm. uh, that there is something if, if, if these are stories which not only need to be told but also heard and 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 listened to and the act of listening is uh, perhaps one of the most political things uh, uh, yeah. uh, that we can do um, uh, at the moment um, uh, uh, you know as well as as Amin was saying, you know, when, as I understood it, when you said all of them, what I really, what I understood immediately was hearing those stories which we have been told, for example, uh, about ourselves and our culture, which of course have been <laughs> eminently shown not to be true. So uh, that's what's been so fascinating where I live in Gloucestershire, just down the road from Bristol, is... Um, you know, to finally hear the story of Edward Colston and, you know, the vast yeah. fortune he made on the slave trade uh, was remarkable. And the tearing down of his statue in Bristol was the most remarkable work of art, really. And it was done by artists. And then a, a remarkable statue was put up in its place of a protester. And it was very, uh, that was very remarkable because the actual story of Colston, which I would guarantee you, 99.999% of Britain had no, uh, no inkling of, opened up a door about the, the way that, you know, uh, in, in fact, what made Britain great was uh, 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 an enormous, th this, this vast exploitation uh, of other people through what we now know as the uh, colonial project. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and that is a story, of course, which is a new story for a lot of people. Yes, I mean, I, I just want to, to, to add something. I think it's important to listen to all the stories because we are in a world where, where so many people feel either excluded or invaded or uh, left behind, or and they they are of all kinds of people, and they they might react in all kinds of ways. So I think in such a diverse world and in our societies, which are diverse, very diverse, we need to have every part of the society, those who were oppressed and also those who were the oppressors, mm -hmm. feel that their story is part of the whole picture. They're not, because what we, what we, the, the discover in some countries where uh, people uh, have reached uh, uh, important positions. Well, I'm thinking of the United States, but so much, so many other, so much many other countries. They are people who, for some reason, maybe we feel this reason is not sufficient, is not legitimate. But for some reason, people feel that they are excluded. They are threatened. They have fears, as Karen was saying. So we have to calm all fears, to take into account all fears by not showing this day to anybody. <laughs> so all the stories have to be present and every person has to be able to identify with the whole picture. That is so true. I'm sure... Uh, you'll have seen, as I did, an article the other day about um, the silencing of the poets of Xinjiang, the Uyghur poets, 
And that is a story that I think is in incredibly important for the world to know. Um, there's a question from uh, Gabriela Chaya. How do you think this difficulty in telling stories and this individualism damages our children? This difficulty? In telling stories and this individualism damages our children. Um. It's quite a, quite a. I mean, I have I have small children, so um, I, and and I have to read them stories every. I don't have to. I uh, m it is my great great joy, uh, reading to them uh, uh, every night um, because I get to see all sorts of stories that I've never uh, uh, read. Children's stories, and I have to say that I'm immensely uh, impressed with the level of. Uh, stories, the, the kind of the variety of stories that there are for children um, in comparison to my own childhood, when there were marvellous stories, but they were of not of this extraordinary, uh, um, uh, diverse uh, uh, origin. So that's an incredibly wonderful thing. But the, 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 uh, um, I think the, the questions the stories for children, certainly my children, it, it, the question is again, this question of how, how are they, what are the things that make them connect up to each other and to the world around them? That is the question that I keep on, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I'm put in front of. It's one of the reasons that every time I've gone away to work, I've tried to take uh, we we try all together to go to, to to go together because that way they have experiences. They they they, they, they you know the, the, there is a there is a problem within certainly within British education as for example the arts have been cut away, uh, uh, sciences have been you know uh, 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 have have also been denigrated, and everything is sort of geared towards the narrative again the narrative of of uh, economic individualism. Um, uh, as if, you know, we are just producing children in order that they should make money. Um, I mean, that's a very obvious thing to say, but the fact is when you have small children, you see the emphasis on results, the emphasis on, uh, uh, on product over journey or voyage. Uh, um, uh, and that doesn't really answer the question, I, uh, but, but, but that was a, an immediate response of mine. I'd just say uh, that to... Children have all kinds of fears. Um, and I, I, I have no children and I don't come in contact with children uh, any anymore, but really. But uh, I know myself as a child, all the fears I had, all the questions that uh, I, I, I had and couldn't, couldn't answer. So do, uh, do stories that perhaps can allay fears and give hope. Hope that, uh, you know, that even, you know, those, those stories about a uh, little, poor little girl, rich girl makes, poor little girl makes good, as it were. Uh, that's, that, that it is possible uh, to, for, for somebody to come from whatever circumstances, and, and, and children have all kinds of fears and terrors and doubts that we, we adults know nothing about, but it is possible uh, to, to sort of come through them. Stories that, uh, in heart, that affirm uh, the, the, the child's groping. Uh, there's, so, there's so much uncertainty, I think, in childhood, uh, so much that you don't know so much that's uh, puzzling and grown-ups seem to be, uh, it, and, and, this, and it must be even more so today with all the social media, etc. So stories that get people to listen, I think. Listen. Uh, there's a question from Adam Gantz. Do the panel think that myths are compassionate? That what? Myths are compassionate. Some are, some aren't. Um, <laughs> yes. Basically, um, yes. um, you know, we, we, we could, we, what is a myth? And I think that needs. Um, I think yes, that's quite, a, quite a, a complicated one, I think. A, a myth, uh, the, the correct uh, idea, of, uh, we often use uh, the word myth as something that isn't true, as something that's a bit of a fantasy. 
but the, the, the technical terminology, the technical dis- bit, uh, definition of a myth is it, a myth is something that in some sense happened once, but which also happens all the time. So that it's uh, a Beautiful. story that is that 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 it has timeless timeless truth, and uh, you've got to be careful of false myths, but uh, myths that uh, that, uh, that 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 allay fears uh, and uh, that that they happen once, but they can also happen all the time. So it's t- it's talking about things that are absolute constant in humanity, archetypal uh, fears, desires, hopes, dreams, etc. that go on and on as some of the, the solutions that we find for ourselves which help and some of them are bad myths and, and don't. I, I mean, I, I, Amen, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I don't have a, a uh, a sophisticated answer, but once I, I was asked about myth, and I said there are two kinds of realities, the, the facts, fiction, and the myth. And I think myth is not fact, it's not fiction, it's something completely different. And I think uh, uh, we're, I'm not very far from what... Uh, can- I mean, I, I, I have to, you know, in the theatre, we have to act myths sometimes mm-hmm. if we if we are playing you know if we're playing if we are playing oedipus we are essentially playing a myth uh Absolutely. and it's a really interesting question as to whether you know how you bring that to life and in fact uh, you know the majority of characters within drama in the theater uh, uh all have a a mythic quality that is to say you know uh um uh, uh um you know it, even in uh, and and somebody like Brecht, of course, emphasizes that with the the good person, etc. And th- these are not, you know, but anybody who uh, and, and of course all of Beckett's characters are mythic. They are not um, fact, and they are not fiction. They are uh, indeed uh, something else. But I mean, I would think I think that the the answer to the question also comes back to this question of uh, separation, because I think one of the things that myth does is connect fact and fiction. Uh, it connects up uh, this world that we experience with the one that uh, uh, for which we have no words, the one which is wordless, beyond words. It connects time with the timeless. It connects the, the fact of uh, uh, having no space to infinite space. Um, uh, 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 and perhaps I feel it, it, it links to compassion in that in the sense that it can uh, uh, it, it is able to uh, close uh, uh, a gap in some way. It's often it has been said that the opposite of to love is not to hate but to separate, and so uh, the myth has this capacity to bring together. And the moment you bring together, you have the capa- the possibility of love. I I would add that. Uh, uh, the in the ancient Greece, in ancient Greece, all these elements were uh, truly connected. Uh, myth was connected to theater, which was connected to philosophy, which was connected to democracy, uh, and the uh, th- philosophy was the first uh, uh, f- philosophical uh, 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 works were. Uh, dialogues mainly and uh, all 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 was really connected and i think it's very enriching to connect everything because every aspect every every element is uh, brings something to the whole and the separation between elements between ev- every discipline uh, is in fact, a, a reduction. And uh, I think we never re- recovered from the separation between all these elements. We need to bring them again together. The one is, it, the, the, I mean, that's, a, a, I think, a, um, a, a, an absolutely a, a, a critical point uh, and is also, um, as, as we, you know, as we, 
begin scientifically to separate out or we have thought to separate out um, uh, um, different elements of our world <laughs> simultaneously what has happened as science has, has advanced uh, it, it, everything has collapsed back in Absolutely. on itself Absolutely. So, you know, uh, 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 there is no, we don't actually know what time is. And it, we know that it is now, it, it, we know that it's inseparable from space. But what it is, uh, 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 it, it, it could be, especially if you read that wonderful man, Carlo Rovelli, uh, um, <laughs> it doesn't actually exist. Although, you know, I have a very strong feeling that it's about uh, uh, 10 to 9 here. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, um but 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 the fact is is that uh, this is the still the, the thrill the great thrill uh, uh, of science is the way that we are discovering further and further and further that everything interconnects just as this this book that I was showing you before about fungi by by uh, Merlin Sheldrake uh, um, uh, called Entangled Life shows that. Um, uh, through the use of fungi, in a sense that that whole forests think together, that they communicate together. This is scientific fact. Mm. This is not fantasy. This is fact. And what we see is that everything, of course, is in a sense inseparable one thing from another. Um, and I think probably the thing that myth does is it helps. It, it, one of its functions is to glue that exactly what you said fact and fiction the the that extra element and in fact it, as karen says beautifully in her book on myth it joins the living and the dead sure. another question from louise bradley we are now constantly available by phone what impact do you think this will have on us as a species on uh, us as a species yes hmm, it's a difficult one um Our phones, you mean? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, I uh, think that it, it, it greatly troubles me sometimes when I look out of my window from my study and I see people walking up and down my nice street endlessly talking on the phone. Um, I, and I was in a, a restaurant uh, in, in Singapore uh, and a couple came in to have lunch together uh, they both took out their phones and then started, spent their whole lunch talking to other people. Um, I think uh, we need to be in the moment more. Uh, to instead of uh, one of the reasons, one of the things that worries me about our view of the natural world is that, you know, I see people on, in a, on a, on walking on a cliff chattering to someone in the office on the phone. So, somewhere else. We need to be where we are at this particular moment. I, but how, Karen, how? We, <laughs> we now have them. I mean, they, we can't go back in time. They are here and it's a really, it's a really, I mean, you know, I suffer from it too. You know, you, we have this constantly received experience. You know, you see something and you take a photograph of it. Yes. Uh, you don't experience it. You, 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 uh, uh, um, you know, and uh, uh, it's why, you know, we first started sending our, our children, certainly at, at, at small age, uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, 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 and, and she was uh, rightly passionate about this so that they would not have to encounter screens too quickly, too early, but there comes a point where they can, simply can't avoid it, uh, and they are absolutely fascinating. And you get um, stuck into it, and to a certain extent, they they become a little bit like Narcissus's pool. Um, Allow me to yes to, I'm in. to tell a, a personal story. I, I was working a few years ago on uh, some. Uh, family documents. I wanted to tell the story of my grandfather and his sister and brothers. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have my grandmother uh, ha had kept everything, everything. And I found uh, uh, letters sent from one village to another, because of course, there was no phone at that time. And I was able to reconstitute events in detail just because there was a flow of of uh, notes notes about 
various uh, items. And I uh, was wondering, today that would not be possible because although we can save anything, <laughs> we can uh, uh, have uh, uh, disks and uh, uh, all USB sticks that, that can contain millions of pages, yet we are not saving much because all of that disappears. And although, although we can access our mail, but mail will disappear because models change and the norms change. And in fact, we are, we are building a moment in history without memory. Mm. While, while we have the possibility of a limited memory, but we are building moments without memory. And the more we let our memories go and don't use them, the more they'll decline. Uh, I think, I mean, I mean, that is true to a um, uh, certain extent, although um, it, there have been studies of showing how uh, memory has actually increased with certain people who, uh, young people who've worked on, um, you know, games that they have, electronic games, that they have uh, actually uh, had an increase in in um, uh, uh, certain certain memorial uh, 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 capacity. So it's not it's not very clear cut. But I feel that they're here to stay, and and that one of the uh, 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 key things. Well, of course they're not here to stay because <laughs> we're standing on the lip of, on the bird lip of disaster. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But but um, uh, I think that what is key is i mean this is my own personal anecdote is that um within the theater um you know the theater begins with somebody telling a story on essentially telling a story uh, uh, and people often refer to theater oh i would like to go back to the theater where people just sort of you know there's the, the, the there's nothing except the person telling a story well the truth is i believe that from prehistoric times that was never the case as i said before right at the beginning i think there was always fire and with fire there were silhouettes and already and that's what my my beloved father who's long dead would have called technology he called flints technology so technology for him was fire and flints now i think uh, that all artists are you know, uh, 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 they're very close. Artists, I think, in, in many ways, are very close to charlatans. I mean, they, you know, they're similar. They have they have a, a lot of things in common. They they try to get themselves out of difficulties. They tell good stories. They tell lies, and you know, fact and fiction mix to a certain extent. But I suppose, uh, I mean, that's a rather a facile point. But um, uh, what I, what I'm trying to say is that I think that um, um, uh, um, uh, that we're constantly adapting as a human species to what we create. So in the theater, once you had light, you start to use it as a form of storytelling, which it always was to a certain extent, but you use the more sophisticated forms to, to continue uh, uh, telling, telling the stories. And then once <coughs> video came into the theater, I too will use video, but in order to tell the story, uh, and these are just tools. These are just like the fire or the flint or whatever. And this thing that we have is, of course, at the moment, because it is a kind of novelty, is almost a master of us. And the question is, and I think this is where artists and writers and uh, 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 people of uh, well, all those of us who are creative um, uh, 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 need to begin to use them to be able to do something other than what they do. And I think this is possible. The difficulty for us is we live in a political system where they are systems where they're being used uh, as a, a form of power over us. Uh, and the question for me is how do we take control of them and empower ourselves with them so that we are not uh, um, uh, uh, oppressed by them. I mean, I was amazed by my my friends in the in the Xingu because uh, at their ceremony in which they were, you know, they had it is very important that they are are painted and they have these very 
very fine bits of um, uh, uh, of 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 grass around their uh, their their middles, and you know they have nothing on essentially. Yet in the back of the piece of grass <laughs> would be a smartphone. Um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, but they are determined that they are part of two that to keep their consciousness as well that they are part of two consciousness that this is part of one consciousness but they also have another and that is uh, uh, the question and that is a form of education and that is perhaps something that we need to give uh, uh, um, uh, and, and find out you know n n not we we know that they can be destructive we know that but the question is uh, how can they be creative yes yeah, no that's that's so it's a, a question of limiting ourselves and, and and using to the best of our ability that i'm afraid i think is is uh, the end of our time it's just now got to nine o'clock and we do have some more questions but i think that that's that's possibly possibly for another yes. time for another time mm -hmm. um well esther thank you very much uh, this has come through complicite and i uh, um being the artistic director i want to thank you for 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 guiding us through this evening it's been really wonderful and it's a real uh, privilege to be able to talk to all of you to karen uh, Karen in uh, um, London and Armin in Paris, Esther in Aberdeen. And it's just, this is the marvel of phones and technology. Yeah, it's, it has been able to be wonderful here. to meet you all. <laughs> and I would love to salute those people in San Francisco or in Brazil or Germany or wherever you are in the world. Thank you very, very much for listening. And I think we'll all, maybe we could just wave goodbye to you.